In the last lecture I was just showing you the course outline and uh, as part of that uh, what I did not uh, specifically mention are the uh, learning outcomes for the course itself. So what are these? Uh, first of all we are trying to identify the fundamental principles of photonics and light matter interactions. Then we are going to try to develop an ability to formulate problems related to photonics, photonic structures, processes and analyze them. And finally we are going to try to identify processes that help to manipulate the fundamental properties of light. And of course that is what we saw uh, in the last uh, lecture uh, we were trying to identify three modules. So th those three modules are consistent with the learning objectives uh, of, of this course. So let us go back and uh, have a quick uh, recap of where we were yesterday. We were uh, uh, starting with a gen general statement as to why we should be interested in photonics. We were trying to list down a uh, number of applications where uh, photonics play a central role and uh, then we went on to say uh, you know uh, when you look at uh, how we try to analyze the photonics processes uh, we start with ray optics where um, as, as Fermat mentioned light travels in straight lines, it is a very simple concept and uh, then we say okay ray optics cannot explain everything some of which we are going to actually look into a little more detail today. Um, so concepts like wavelength and phase of light uh, is not something that uh, you can capture in ray optics. So you necessarily have to go into wave optics. and. Uh, then of course even the wave optics is not sufficient to explain uh, you know concepts that are based on polarization of light. So uh, to capture those we go to electromagnetic optics which uh, started with uh, Maxwell uh, you know making his uh, declaration around uh, the mid 1800s that uh, light travels as electromagnetic waves. And then I, I got this wrong the year wrong um, Planck actually came up with this uh, paper in 1900 um, that uh, essentially was saying that light emission and uh, absorption are quantized and then that was followed by Einstein's observation that light itself comprise of uh, quanta of energy which uh, later on uh, was defined as photons. So um, as I was mentioning yesterday we are starting with ray optics examples in ray optics and then we will proceed to looking at examples with uh, wave optics and uh, beyond that we will get on to uh, electromagnetic optics and, and, and uh, eventually to quantum optics okay. That is what we are going to uh, uh, progress and as far as wave optics uh, uh, sorry ray optics examples are concerned we took the example of uh, endoscopy where we said um, you know we need an optical probe for doing endoscopy and how do we go about designing this optical probe. And designing this optical probe we said it is fairly simple um, we just need to know the law of reflection and law of refraction so we were just revising that a little bit. And then we went on to uh, define uh, this structure wherein um, you have uh, 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 and, and material with refractive index n1 which is uh, surrounded by uh, another material with refractive index n2 and then we said we could have total internal reflection at the interface if the angle at which um, the light ray hits the interface is greater than the critical angle right and then we said we could have reflection and then if you have a consistent structure. Uh, where you have this interface between N1 and N2 and those two interfaces are parallel to each other then we will have consistent guiding of light 
within this uh, within this structure. So let's go on and look at this in little more detail. Uh, what we are typically interested as far as the endoscope is concerned is you have a, a structure, let's say a waveguide structure because we are saying that, that we are actually guiding a light guiding structure and um, what is the maximum cone of angles that we can uh, pick up using this structure. So I have tried to lay out, out um, uh, in, in this picture wherein what we need to do is take care of this condition that is the incident angle being greater than um, the critical angle as far as uh, this interface between N1 and N2 is concerned. And then if you trace it back and you see what that means as far as the launch of light into this uh, structure is concerned, um, what we, so you will have to essentially look at what is happening at, uh, at, at this interface over here. Um, so typically the outside medium is air and then you are going into uh, a glass material. So let us say with a refractive index N1. Okay, you can apply Snell's law over here and what we are actually trying to find out is the maximum angle which can be supported uh, at, at this interface such that the light is guided through the structure, right. So the limiting condition for, for such a guiding is theta 1 equal to theta c. Why? Because we clearly need to have this angle satisfied, we, we need to have an incident angle greater than theta c for uh, light to be guided. And if you look at the Snell's law at this particular interface, for very small angles of theta naught, for example, the limiting case is where theta naught is going straight down this, this dotted line over here, um, so the light ray is going straight down there is no problem, light will go straight through this, this waveguide. And as you increase theta naught, okay, you get to a point where your, you know, angle at this interface is going to become smaller and smaller, okay. And if the angle theta 1, if it is becoming less than theta c, then there is no guiding of light. Right? So, the limiting condition would be theta 1 equal to theta c. So, if I am able to find the corresponding angle theta naught, then I would say that anything within that cone of angles defined by theta naught is going to be guided in this structure. Anything outside of theta naught is going to be such that theta 1 becomes less than theta c, then it is not guided by the structure, okay. So these cone of angles that is, uh, uh, you know, allowing light to be guided in the structure is called numerical aperture of this uh, endoscope. So, so what we are actually trying to get to is what is the numerical aperture of this waveguide, of, of this light guide, right. We have not started talking about waves, so we will just keep it as a light guide, okay. So to do that, I go and apply Snell's law at uh, this interface over here, at that input interface. So I write N0 sin theta0 equals to N1 sin of this angle, but but the refracted angle, we would realize that if this is theta c, then this angle is theta c, that is the opposite angle, right. And this has to be pi by 2 minus theta c, right. So I would just say on, on this side, it has to be n1 sine of pi by 2 minus theta c. That we know corresponds to cos theta c right 
and cos theta c can be written in times of, in terms of sin theta c as root of 1 minus sin square theta c and what we saw in yes uh, in the last lecture is that sin theta c is given by n2 divided by n1 so i substitute that over here okay so you get n1 root of 1 minus n2 over n1 the whole square okay and if i take the common um, uh, you know uh, if i take n1 in common then i get this simple expression which says sin theta not especially since we are considering n not corresponds to air n not equals to 1 then sin theta not is root of n1 square minus n2 square okay so this is a very simple picture that is enabled by ray optics right we didn't do anything other than law of reflection law of refraction here and we, and we came up with this sort of uh, formulation okay so and of course what this tells you is that you want a very large numerical aperture what should you have what do you want from an endoscope normally you want a very large field of view so you can see things you know on either side over a fairly long angular spread right so how is that enabled as far as the structure is concerned n1 has to be much greater than n2 so if you have a large index contrast between the two media right you can you can essentially support a large numerical aperture so how is this realized you basically have a, a cylindrical wire okay with refractive index n1 let's say it's made of glass and you coat it with a polymer right with a much lower refractive index so glass you know you say refractive index of 1.5 and that's actually a very loose definition i should tell you because that's what you hear in high school textbooks that glass is refractive index of 1.5 water is refractive index of 1.33 and so on but uh, you have to take that with a pinch of salt because in reality that refractive index is actually dependent on wavelength remember this thing about how do you fo form a rainbow right how do you how do you get a rainbow naturally in sunlight consisting of different colors is going through this raindrop which can be modeled as a prism made of water water essentially has a different refractive index slightly different refractive index for each of those colors so when you apply snell's law each of those colors separate out in terms of the angle of refraction and that is essentially what you see as dispersion um, which causes the rainbow right so so in general that's a that's a key thought that you should have in mind that the refractive index of material or in, in, in more basic terms is the permittivity of the material the response the dielectric response of a material is frequency dependent or wavelength dependent or in in layman's language color dependent so it depends on the color as to what is the refractive index but nevertheless if you say that um, you have a glass central structure surrounded by a polymer structure which is of much lower refractive index then you can make an endoscope with a very large numerical aperture with a very large field of view okay so that is what goes into the design of an endoscope the, the optical probe for an endoscope which uh, we we just now uh, explained using ray optics principles so um, ray optics principles in general go a uh, um, long way um, with ray optics we just saw how to design an endoscope we can explain um, dispersion in a prism right 
Uh, you can explain, uh, for example, uh, you, can, you can actually do uh, optical system design, right? So, which is consisting of multiple uh, lenses, multiple mirrors and so on. You can, you can do all that optical system design and uh, you can go all the way up to designing a telescope. A telescope is nothing but, um, you know, a, a series of uh, uh, lens elements that are uh, uh, put together. Uh, you can go all the way up to designing the Hubble telescope. You know what a Hubble telescope is? This telescope that people put in space, right, uh, which is capturing images of uh, the, the galaxy, uh, uh, you know, deep out in, in space. Um, so something as sophisticated as that could actually be the, the uh, basic design of the telescope can be achieved by just ray optics principles. That is the power of considering light as something that just travels in straight lines and, and you are able to deal with uh, how it propagates through uh, multiple interfaces. Okay, so let us just look at how do you go about designing something. I do not have time to go through this in very high level of detail, but let, let me just give you a feel for how people do this, this complex uh, lens systems, optical systems, how do they use ray optics to, uh, to, to see how light propagates uh, through these systems, right? So, let us say um, you have an optical system, one of the uh, key things that you define is an optical axis, basically the central, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, line that joins all the uh, optics within that system. Um, so, let us say it consists of, uh, of a lens here, another lens over here, let us say uh, those two are um, what I call biconvex lenses and this is actually a biconcave lens and maybe another lens over here, right? So, if you want to analyze a system like this, you, what you want to know uh, effectively is if I consider a plane over here and a plane over here, okay, I want to look at a ray that is incident on this plane, okay? what happens to the ray as it propagates through the system and, and specifically I am interested in how the ray comes out of that optical system, right? That is a typical problem that we, uh, uh, that we look at. So, what you could do is define the distance from the optical axis y1 and let us say uh, it is making an angle theta 1 with respect to the optical axis and over here you go to y2 and that is existing, exiting the system with an angle theta 2, okay. So, the idea is if you are talking about a linear um, homogeneous system that is, that is within that lens, it is all homogeneous or within the propagation between the lenses, it is all homogeneous uh, medium. If you, if you consider medium like this, you can actually write the output y2, okay, in terms of the input parameters. Basically, you say it has some dependence on um, where the ray is entering the system, so y1 and it has got some dependence on what angle the ray is entering the system, theta 1. Similarly, if you want to find theta 2, that again has a, has a linear res, uh, dependence on, um, you know, what is, uh, how it is coming in. So, you have C times y1 plus D times theta 1, okay, to the point that um, you can write this in matrix form, y2 theta 2 is what you want to find out, y1 theta 1 is the input, 
and then you have this matrix A, B, C, D which defines this optical system, okay. So, if you can model the propagation of a light ray within each section of this optical system through each surface of this optical system, then essentially um, let us say this is this is what you call as the ray matrix and the ray matrix is actually going through multiple um, you know sections, multiple surfaces and each one of those has its own ABCD matrix, okay. So, you say let us say there are n such occurrences m n, m n minus 1 and so on up to m 1, this would be the effective matrix that defines this entire thing. Let us just take one quick example and see how this works. So, and I will take a very simple example uh, in the interest of time. So, let us say I just have a ray that is going straight through this system, okay. I want to define how the propagation happens through free space, okay, without any, um, any elements coming to the picture. So, how would the ABCD matrix look for something like this, okay. So, I can essentially write, uh, so this is Y1, this is Y2, um, this is theta 1, this is theta 2, okay. So, we know that theta 2 equals to theta 1, right? And what is y 2? So, whatever this distance of propagation is, let us say that is that corresponds to d. So, you essentially say this is going to be given by y 1 plus d times theta 1. Okay. So, this would correspond to, I just flipped it, but, but you know y 2 goes uh, up and theta 2 comes uh, below that. So, the A, B, C, D matrix corresponding to this is 1, A corresponds to value of 1, um, B corresponds to a value of D, that is the distance of propagation in this medium, C is 0, okay, that is a coefficient of y 1 and that is that is 0 and uh, d is 1. So, the A, B, C, D matrix for a simple propagation through free space corresponds to this. So, you can um, do this for a lens as well, okay. And especially um, there is one uh, approximation which becomes very handy in, in these sort of situations. This approximation is called the paraxial approximation, paraxial, right. So, it is something to do with axis. So, what does paraxial mean? It essentially means that we are considering rays to be having a very small angle with respect to the optical axis, okay. So, in the paraxial approximation, if you write sin theta, when theta is small, what is the value of sin theta? Theta itself. So, it can be approximated as theta. So, how does that help? Because as you are propagating through this you know optical system you are encountering surfaces and at each surface you are applying Snell's law. Snell's law says sin n 1 sin theta 1 equal to n 2 sin theta 2, but you do not want to put all these sin cos things within this matrix. So, Snell's law will become n 1 theta 1 equal to n 2 theta 2 in the paraxial approximation, okay. Then it is easy to you know, form a corresponding 
matrix and, and, and then go through this thing. So, what is the disadvantage of this? Obviously, you cannot account for rays that are making a very large angle with respect to the optical axis. So, if you have a very large numerical aperture, like what we were trying to do with the endoscope, you know, we are trying to have a very large numerical aperture, that cannot be modeled here. But if you are talking about modeling a telescope, a telescope is seeing something that is happening, you know, thousands and millions of kilometers away, light coming from there is going to be fairly aligned to the optical axis of, of, uh, of your telescope, right. So, paraxial approximation works very well if you are looking at really distant objects. Can you apply that for a microscope? Probably not, right. So, you are trying to magnify a, a, a small object and uh, uh, you have a very large uh, spread of angles within that and so it is not easy to apply that to a microscope, okay. So, that just gives you uh, a general thought of how far you can take ray optics, okay. Any questions before we move on? Why is the? So, why? So, all of these, once we put it in this form, all of these are linear transformations, right. So, so the entire system becomes a linear system. And we are considering homogeneous material. So, so yeah, we are taking essentially a linear response from the system. That is the basic assumption, okay. So, let us move on and um, move back to what we wanted to uh, carry on with, uh, you know, for the rest of today's lecture, okay. And that actually takes us back to this tiny tidbit that I gave at the end of the last lecture. What did we do? What did I ask you to do? Right? There is one word to explain that. Right? So, diffraction of, of light is what is happening. So, what is diffraction? Now, whatever we have been saying so far or whatever we have been seeing so far is that when you have a large opening, you can use ray optics to see what is happening on the other side, right. And when I say large, what exactly do I mean? Large is how large? Very good. So, it is it's comparative to the wavelength of light. So, if you have um, an opening with uh, let us say d as the dimension that is far, far greater than the wavelength of light, right. So, you can explain everything by ray optics. But what happens if you have a very tiny aperture, very small aperture. So, in this case d approaches lambda, okay. As d approaches lambda, there is very little light that is going through, but we are not worried about how much is the intensity of light? We are worried about characterizing the property of light beyond that point. And this is what um, Huygens did, um, you know, much earlier, several centuries ago. He actually said that light propagates through the structure as, as waves, okay. So, his hypothesis at, at that particular point was that light propagates with waves very much like um, uh, a pebble dropped in water, right. So, you say you see waves that are uh, going out from the point where the uh, pebble has uh, uh, gone through the water surface 
And um, another example could be um, sound from a loudspeaker, right? So you have this loudspeaker blaring out and you can hear that sound over a very uh, wide region uh, because, uh, you know, sound is propagating uh, as waves from that uh, source and, and, it's, and it's actually spreading around. So, ray optics breaks down, right? When you consider features that are comparable to the wavelength of light, okay? That's a, that's a key thought that you want to carry on, right? Ray optics it gets limited when, when it, it is actually having to deal with uh, structures where the feature sizes are comparable to the wavelength of light. So, you have to jump over to wave optics and you need to understand how light propagates as waves, okay? And uh, any problem where you are dealing with propagation of waves, where does it start? Where would you start any formal uh, problem which start, uh, which is dealing with waves, propagation of waves? Huh? The wave equation, right? So, what does the wave equation tell you? Basically, del square of u, let us say u corresponds to the um, uh, a description of the light wave, okay. Uh, del square u minus 1 over c square is uh, multiplied by dou square u over dou t square is equal to 0. That is your wave equation. Now, of course, you are familiar with this in a slightly different manner. Uh, a lot of you would have seen this in electromagnetics. Um, in uh, in electromagnetics, what you would have seen is U is replaced by E or H, the electric or magnetic field, right? So, if you, if you substitute U, instead of U, you substitute E or H, you get the wave equation which from Maxwell's equations, you know, a couple of steps, you, you get to the wave equation, right? So, that is the same format that we have, okay. Um, there is something, uh, one approximation that you can take at this point in terms of finding a solution for the wave equation. And that approximation is, is associated with the general observation that when you look at waves, these waves are normally periodic in nature, right? So, so you, you, you drop a pebble in water, you see these waves and those waves are essentially periodic in nature. So, you can actually go on to describing them as time periodic signals and what is the advantage of looking at them as time periodic signals? If I am looking at the solution for u in terms of let us say Cartesian coordinates x, y, z and t, the time dependence then this can be written as u of x, y, z and then the time dependence comes out as e power j omega t, right? e power j omega t is basically cos omega t plus j sin omega t, right? So, it is basically representing a, a, a sinusoid, okay? So, we are saying it is basically a time periodic signal which corresponds to a sinusoid and we represent it this way. What is the advantage of representing this way? If I want to take a derivative with respect to t, if I differentiate this with respect to t, then that will give you me j omega, right? And rest of it is going to, the u is going to remain the same. And if I want to do a second derivative, which is what we are trying to do uh, over here, right? If I want to do a second derivative, that is nothing but minus omega square, okay? So, I can substitute instead of this uh, di second differential here, I can substitute with minus omega square which gives me 
del square u plus some uh, you know, uh, variable k, k square u equal to 0. So, this is my wave equation for a time periodic case, okay, where um, k is given by omega over c, omega is nothing but the angular frequency. So, you can write it as 2 pi f over c and c over f is what? c is the velocity of that electromagnetic wave or sorry in this case this light wave and uh, f is the uh, frequency. So, c over f would correspond to lambda. So, you can write k as 2 pi over lambda. So, what does that mean? Essentially, if I look at the solution of this, right, the, the solution of this, let us say uh, this uh, corresponds to a wave um, that is propagating in let us say the z direction, positive z direction, okay. Then um, the uh, solution of this can be written as um, u of r, where r can be some uh, any radial parameter is given by a of r um, multiplied by e power uh, minus j k z e power j omega t, okay. Um, so, how do I get minus j k z? Um, if you go back here, this del square is actually a Laplacian, okay. So, in Cartesian coordinates, this corresponds to dou square over dou x square plus dou square over dou y square plus dou square over dou z square, right. Now, if I say it is propagating along z and I say it is actually um, propagating uh, with very little loss, okay, then the z propagation I can I can write it is is only there is a uh, you know accumulation of a phase in that in that term and that is what uh, we we get over here. So, if I actually look at this in the z direction what I would find is this is basically uh, you are looking at u of r, what you would find is it is actually propagating in some, uh, it is varying in some sinusoidal uh, fashion and uh, this from where it goes from 0 and, and goes to 0 again, what does that correspond to? In space, wavelength. And over at over the wavelength, how much phase does it accumulate? It accumulates a phase of 2 pi radians. So, effectively what we are saying is this term is representing the phase that, that the wave accumulates as it is propagating, okay. And, uh, this e power j omega t term is actually a fairly boring term. I mean, it is it is representing the time dependence, but it is actually a periodic wave. So, you know, so that is not changing when it is when it is going through uh, uh, material, right, a linear material. So, um, we can choose to just consider the wave as a what is called a, a phasor. So, u can be considered as a phasor which means that the representation is e power uh, sorry a multiplied by it has got some amplitude a um, and e power j phi, okay. Because we are interested in uh, tracking the phase which actually is changing during the propagation of that light, okay. So, 
I can I can just represent this in a very simple form in the phasor form and uh, u in general can be uh, a complex quantity. So, you can um, represent the plot the real part of u against the imaginary part of u. So, when I am plotting like this what type of plot is this? It is a plot in the complex plane. What do we call this? We heard of a polar plot right. So, you, you essentially have a polar plot where um, this is a phasor with an angle phi and um, you know it is called a, a magnitude A ok. So, you can you can represent this in terms of uh, a, a phasor and now if you want to define propagation we know it is actually going through a sinusoid. So, you can say that as it propagates it accumulates phase right and it is basically going round and round in this phasor. So, it, it, it basically goes around and, 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 and it is it's repetitive con, you know uh, just indicating that it is actually a time periodic function right. So, now with this we can go ahead and explain what happens when um, uh, two waves come together which is what uh, it is amazing this experiment was done in 1801 as early as 1801. Um, uh, so, this, this person Young, Thomas Young did this uh, experiment right. Thomas Young did this experiment where he basically defined two slits ok, um, which are uh, separated by let us say it is a center to center separation corresponds to D and then he was uh, observing um, the propagation of light through this. So, you have a, a wave that is that is uh, incident on this aperture. So, what happens and, and these each of those slits were quite small, small in sense it is approaching wavelength. So, effectively what you expect is this goes on like this and then similarly you have another wave that like this it is similar to in a bucket of water you drop two pebbles both the pebbles uh, hit the water at the same time and you have these waves that are coming across and and then they um, they add with each other at, at some point right. So, and, and, and they may cancel each other at some other point. So, let us say this is our uh, um, observation plane. So, what do we see over here? So, let us actually define um, a, an optical axis that goes through this and uh, what you see on this side is a, a fringe pattern like this which goes to a maximum and a minimum alternatively ok. Um, so, how, how do you explain this fringe pattern? Essentially, if you look at the total intensity over here let us say that corresponds to I, I corresponds to let us say the field uh, is represented by U. So, the magnitude of the field and square of that corresponds to I, but this is now represented by two different waves. One wave which is represented by U1 is A1 e power j phi 1 and another wave which is represented by U2 corresponding to a 2 e power j phi 2 ok. So, u is consisting of contributions 
from both those waves, so u1 plus u2, and both are complex quantities, right? So when you do this square, what you get is u1 square plus u2 square, and then the bead terms between them. And since it's a complex quantity, what you'll get is u1 u2 conjugate plus u1 conjugate u2, right? So you substitute the uh, respective expressions, the phasors for u1 and u2. What you get is this one, um, u1 square is going to correspond to i1, intensity of wave 1, u2 square corresponding to i2 plus 2 root i1 i2 e power j phi 1 minus phi 2 because we are looking at the conjugate of u2, right? And uh, similarly, the other term is going to be 2 root i1 i2 e power minus j phi 1 minus phi 2. Right? So, those are going to be the two beat terms and uh, you can simplify that and I am going to slide over here to do this. So, I can write my total intensity i now. So, it has got a common beat term root of 2 root i1 i2 and then you are adding these two terms e power j phi 1 minus phi 2 and its conjugate. Right? So, when you add those two, what do you get? So, e power j theta is cos theta plus j sin theta, right? So, you are going to get, sorry, um, I made a mistake here. So, there is no 2 over here, that is just root of i1, i2, right? So, when you add these two, you get a 2 cos theta term because the, the sign terms are cancelling each other. So, you have i1 plus i2 plus 2 root i1 i2 cos of phi1 minus phi2, okay? So, if, if i1 equals to i2, let us say is equal to i0, then what do you get? i is going to be given by um, 2 times i naught multiplied by 1 plus cos of delta phi, right? So, that is in effect the, um, the, the response that you, that, that you would see as a function of delta phi, okay? I will just leave you with this thought. Um, essentially, if you plot, you know, um, this i as a function of delta phi, then what you get is, the, it basically goes through this, uh, um, you know, sinusoidal function. When delta phi is 0, then this, this corresponds to the maximum. That, that corresponds to 2 times i naught and then it is going to become a 0 at some point, go to a maximum, go to a 0 at some point and so on. Where does it go to 0? i becomes 0 when delta phi equals to pi, right? And uh, similarly, um, you know, uh, when, when delta phi equals to uh, 2 pi it will go to the maximum and 3 pi it will go to minimum and so on. So, what does that tell you? Um, these are representative of constructive interference and these points are representative of destructive interference. So, constructive interference happens, well, let us first finish destructive interference. Destructive interference happens when delta phi equals to odd integral multiples of pi, 
right? And constructive interference happens when delta phi equals to even integral multiples of pi, okay? So, that is of course, a uh, lot of you know that intuitively, but uh, if you go through the wave picture, you know, you can, you can show this. But the idea here and the idea that we are going to propagate forward is that to check this constructive and destructive interference criteria, you do not have to model that entire wave, okay. You just model the propagation phase that it accumulates and you just compare the phase between the, uh, the, 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 the light beams that are uh, uh, coming together, okay. And based on that, you can actually uh, see constructive and, and destructive interference. And um, uh, just working backwards, it all started with saying that light has this, when, when light approaches features whose sizes are comparable to the wavelength of that light, right, then it undergoes, it, it actually exhibits wave phenomena, which means that it undergoes this uh, diffraction, it, it actually bends around uh, uh, the, these uh, apertures and uh, that can give you, you know, this sort of uh, things where once you, once you consider them as secondary wavelets, those wavelets can come together and can interfere with each other and it can give you constructive and destructive interference, okay. For those of you that are uh, taking this online course, we will have a, a demo of this uh, experiment which uh, uh, looks at diffraction of light and using the property of diffraction of light, how to uh, measure uh, certain feature sizes, okay. So that is what we are going to see and moving forward, going towards uh, next week, we are going to look at this in little more detail and uh, we are going to uh, look at something else that is very important which I have not touched uh, uh, much here, that is the property of the light source. So you start defining that to for all this to happen the way it is projected, you need to have a coherent light source. So then what is the meaning of coherence, how do you uh, quantify coherence? You know, those are the things that we are going to see in, uh, in, the, in the upcoming week, okay. So let us stop at this point. Thank you.